This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the Mini Med School in Pediatrics. Um, I'm Glenn Rosenbluth. I'm one of the course co-chairs. So we have a great speaker this evening, Dr. Neil Rojas, who's faculty in the Department of Pediatrics. Um, Dr. Rojas trained in pediatrics here at UCSF and then did a fellowship in uh, developmental behavioral pediatrics in Boston, and then we were fortunate to get him back on the West Coast. Um, where he currently works at the Center for Developing Minds um, down on the peninsula and also at San Francisco General Hospital and does a great deal of teaching and is, is one of our most valuable educators in the Department of Pediatrics and the Pediatric Residency Program. Um, so keeping with the theme that we've gone with some, with some of our other lectures of new approaches to keeping kids healthy and trying to understand that balance between what's normal kid behavior and what becomes disease and, and when does a pediatrician get involved. Um, we have a great talk this evening on ADHD and ADD, diagnostic and treatment strategies that work. Let me turn it over to Dr. Rojas. Thank you, Glenn. That was very kind. Um, I wanna make sure everybody understands sort of my perspective as a developmental behavioral pediatrician. Uh, I'm a fairly rare breed. There aren't a lot of developmental behavioral pediatricians around. Um, First and foremost, I'm a pediatrician. I, I, I care for kids, uh, and I'm a medical doctor. Um, as Glenn mentioned, I did extra training, um, a three-year fellowship in, in developmental behavioral pediatrics. And um, I've been practicing, and if you include my training, developmental behavioral pediatrics for uh, about eight years now, and pediatrics in general for about 12 years now. And my perspectives are going to come from uh, the vantage point of, of seen a lot of children and working with a lot of families in multiple settings. Um, I've worked in public hospitals such as Santa Clara Valley Medical Center and San Francisco General. Um, I've worked in an academic setting uh, such as Children's Hospital in Boston. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, I, I've worked in a uh, private practice in Los Gatos. And it never ceases to amaze me how m many of the fundamental questions parents have about their kids are the same across cultures and socioeconomic and geographic areas. So um, my dis disclosure and acknowledgement, I have nothing to disclose. Uh, I have no financial relationships to products or uh, treatment modalities mentioned in this presentation. I'd also like to uh, formally thank Eugenia Chan, one of my mentors in fellowship, who gave me a couple of these slides, as well as Damon Korb, who's been one of my mentors after fellowship uh, down at the Center for Developing Minds and uh, he's been generous with some of these slides as well. I always like to start off um, a presentation uh, throwing questions out that seem to be important uh, to try to answer or at least to get people thinking. Um, I, I stole one uh, from, from the write-up uh, uh, of the Mini Med School for this topic. Uh, are children today more inattentive or hyperactive than we were? So if you can remember way back to when you were a kid and think about how active you were or your peers were and can tell lots of stories about lots of kids. I grew up in the mountains in Sonoma County. Um, so there was a lot of active boys and a few active girls. Um, but the question is, how would we know whether or not hyperactivity or inattention had changed over the ages without a time machine? It would be extremely hard to, to understand that. Uh, one thing that may have changed uh, since I was a youth 
uh, a long time ago, was uh, it, or is educational standards and uh, the, the, the general pressure I think a lot of children feel uh, this day and age and consequently their parents feel uh, for them to achieve. And I think if the biological bar has not gone down in terms of our capacity as a species in this short period of time, 50, 60 years that we've been talking about ADD, ADHD, perhaps the societal bar has gone up in terms of what we expect of children uh, in terms of what they're supposed to do, whether it's developmentally appropriate for them to be able to do that. Um, I often say, well, what is it that we think has happened with children in the last 50 years that makes them be, you know, able to do, uh, you know, algebra by the time they're seven or eight? Because uh, certainly in Silicon Valley, where my private practice is, I, I, I have families who think that that's normal, and it's not. Uh, I, I remind folks that in other countries, uh, such as Scandinavia, where they have very, very high literacy and education rates, uh, most professional educators don't even think about emphasizing uh, reading until a child seven years of age. Um, seven years of age, seven. Um, and, uh, and that's probably more congruent with the biology and the, and the things that are necessary for children to be able to sit still and read and decode. Um, a few of the other questions, uh, that I wanted to throw out there is, you know, sort of what's normal variation of what's often called self-regulation, um, and it's related to attention. So um, that means where is it okay to say he's just active or she's just active versus hyperactive? Drawing that line is tricky. Uh, there's a lot of diversity uh, in how children behave in different settings, and drawing a very, very clear mark in the sand, it's hard to do. Um, and that, that begs the question, where does normal end and pathology begin? Um, uh, the more we look at what's developmentally sort of appropriate for attention, uh, I think the more gray uh, the answers on what pathology versus okay, normal, functional, uh, the answer is. Um, something that's generally really important, uh, I think, for the public at large to understand about ADHD is what are the lookalikes? Uh, meaning, what are the other things that can masquerade as an attention problem or can cause uh, what looks like functionally uh, an attention problem? I'm going to touch on that heavily um, with a few slides. And then I think really important, which ties into the, t the, the title of this talk, um, what are the proper or accepted uh, diagnostic approaches and treatment strategies um, to help uh, children with attention challenges? So. Lots of questions, hopefully some answers, and lots of time in the end for you to ask questions. My background um, in developmental behavioral pediatrics, the training is uh, largely um, sort of driven by one of the founders of the field, uh, a guy named Mel Levine, who tries to help people understand that attention is actually a complex function of the brain. It is not something that's sort of yes or no. It's, 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 it's not binary. Uh, it's, it's complex. And um, a great quote uh, from Dr. Levine is, is for attention uh, to work well, uh, basically um, it functions as a good conductor of an orchestra of many parallel uh, functions of the brain that serve uh, the attention system. And if we try to break, boil down as, as, as basically and, and somewhat simplistically as possible what those functions are, um, Dr. Levine uh, boiled them down to mental energy control, processing controls, production controls, and planning and organization. And fleshing this out a little bit more, what, what mental energy control is the ability to control your, your focus like a laser beam. Okay, and the analogy that's quite effective, I think, in, in helping people understand what's meant by this mental energy control is sort of, if you know anything about how cars run, the fuel injection system. Okay, when, when you step on the gas of your car, uh, whether it's a Prius or a Mazda or a Chevy, you know, the idea is 
more mental energy, more energy should be delivered to the engine to do the, the work of the car, to go up the hill or, what, or whatever it's doing. This thing, the same thing exists in the brain. Um, people bear down. They focus more. Uh, they try to uh, marshal more of their energy on tasks that are harder. And when we see breakdowns of attention functioning, mental energy control is often a very large uh, part of it. So as a result, there's procrastination, there's avoidance of things that are harder because intuitively a person knows if something's really hard, it's going to demand more, and uh, they tend to avoid it. Processing controls have to do with the input, all of the different stimuli that comes in that one can choose or not choose to pay attention to. And I liken this to, to a filter or a strainer. Some folks have really big holes in their strainer and stuff just falls through. And other folks have too fine a holes on their strainer and they, 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 everything is important and they're overwhelmed. And having the right gradation of that strainer of your, of your stimuli in each situation and being able to shift that, the, the pores of that is an important function uh, that is called processing controls. Production controls uh, are just the opposite. Uh, whereas processing is input, production is output. So being able to modulate and modify one's output, like I'm doing right now as I look across the room, I'm saying, uh-oh, I'm going to lose a couple people. I better liven it up. Uh, <laughs> or some people look confused. Maybe I should slow it down a little bit. Uh, maybe I need to speak higher. Maybe I need to speak lower. Maybe I need to speak faster. Just like the conductor of an orchestra would be talking to different sections with his or her hands, trying to get them to come on quicker or slower or faster or louder or more quiet. Um, the next big function and more advanced function of the attention system that's often um, uh, overlaps with what are called executive functions is what allows us to plan and organize um, using uh, the concepts of memory, uh, time, and space. So I like to use the example of how does, how does a child or how does a learner think about doing something the second time they've done it? The first time they did it, maybe it didn't go so well. Maybe they didn't understand it. Maybe they worked too slowly. Maybe they worked too quickly. How are they going to adjust now and plan how they're going to do it the second time? What are the materials that they're going to need that they learned that they needed from the first time? What kind of space do they need to do the activity? Um, that skill obviously develops later in childhood. So how this pans out for children uh, in terms of attention functions are expectations that we have for them and what they, they'll need to do. Uh, and I think school is, a, is, a, is sort of the real stressor and tester of, of attention in kids. Uh, by age four to five, so sort of late preschool, early kinder, we expect children to be able to participate in circle time, be able to sit still and focus their attention on whomever's presenting uh, for several minutes, okay, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, we expect that same child who can sit in circle time and not move around too much uh, and play by the rules of circle time to delay gratification if she sees that they're setting up snack across the room, not to go put it in her mouth. Okay, be able to go, ooh, I'm hungry, but I'm going to wait till the teacher dismisses me from circle time. We expect that same child, if she's moving around too much, to be able to modulate her behavior if a peer goes, don't touch me, or a teacher goes, please keep your hands to yourself, or my favorite line in preschool and kindergarten is crisscross applesauce. I mean, kids cross their legs and that actually helps them uh, stay more physically quiet. We expect that same child when she finally is allowed to uh, get ready for a snack uh, to attend to the details of things, basic tasks like washing her hands. Okay? And for a four-year-old, a detail of washing one's hands is something that older children or adults might take for granted, like using soap. <laughs> That's an important detail of washing one's hand. Right? convinced to this day that scented soap was invented so that we can tell that kids actually used it when they washed their hands. <laughs> That's an important detail, though. Um, and we also expect uh, four- and five-year-olds to be able to independently keep on a task at least long enough to get into the task and the desired sort of lesson from the task. So, for example, when I drop my preschool off every morning, they've got all these puzzles set out on tables, and I think they expect them all to sit down and look at the puzzle and spend several minutes solving it. Some three-year-olds do this. Most don't. Uh, 
a few more four-year-olds do this. Most five-year-olds can do this. Um, within a year or two, by the time we're in first grade, the expectations are significantly higher. Uh, sustaining concentration is now needed for 20, 30 minutes uh, during lessons and activities. Uh, being able to filter more distractions of a louder classroom, a busier classroom, um, and children who are allowed to be more independently in a first grade classroom who will interrupt each other and distract each other. Um, we also expect uh, first graders to be able to plan things out, to have their materials ready, uh, to have their backpack packed, to turn in their homework. Uh, and these are large expectations, uh, I think, for that age, and they, it still varies considerably. That being said, it is extremely important that we think about what happens when this breaks down. What happens when a, a, a teacher tells a parent, this isn't working, I'm having difficulty with your child. Uh, what, what is the pathology that is called ADHD? From my perspective, this is what I was taught as a fellow. This comes directly out of the, uh, the template we used when we wrote reports for families when we, when we gave them um, our evaluations. Uh, there's a lot in this, but I think a lot of it speaks fairly true to this day uh, after seeing hundreds of more patients since fellowship in, in my own experience. Um, and some of it is a little bit arcane and a little bit mysterious, and I think the general public especially needs to understand what, what's meant by this. So I'm just going to read this quote. ADHD is, neurologically, is a neurologically based condition that is outside the realm of maturity and motivation. Okay? I highlight outside the realm of maturity and motivation because ADHD is considered a disease. It's considered something that is dysfunctional about how a child is working or an adult is working. And it never surprised, I mean, it continues to surprise me how often parents say, well, if you would just try harder. And the, the problem with the attention functions is the try harder part is the problem. <laughs> That's the, one of the fundamental uh, aspects of how the attention system works, is being able to step on that gas and marshal uh, uh, control over one's mental energy is an, an integral part of what's broken down. Uh, so in other words, children cannot simply outgrow these differences, nor can they be expected to overcome them through sheer effort alone. Okay? Uh, they will require intensified educational supports in order to be taught strategies for overcoming these weaknesses. Children and adults with ADHD exhibit a variety of behavioral and academic profiles. So I highlight that uh, phrase because the diversity of people, uh, children and adults, who suffer from varying types of attention dysfunctions is, is large. And it's no, no two children that I diagnose or that I see have attention problems are the same. Um, and that's, you know, I think George Carlin said, where would you be without a good stereotype? You know, you think about what's the stereotype of the kid with ADD or ADHD, okay? It, you know, I'm going to get to some slides and some of the old pejorative uh, terminology that was used, but everybody in their mind sort of got this mindset of what's this kid like? You know, he's, he's, he's bouncing off the walls and he won't, he won't be quiet and he won't stop touching people, or, or she's very dreamy and she doesn't know what you're saying. Um, and, and those are two stereotypes. Um, and children uh, you know, are a little more complex than that, uh, especially when uh, they're interacting in multiple environments. Um, and the last part, many of these children also have coexisting learning disabilities in addition to the academic challenges that their ADHD presents. So here's the rub. It's not simple. It's not just attention. There are other what I call neurocognitive or neurodevelopmental skills that might not be working adequately, such as the skills needed for reading or writing or doing math or controlling one's coordination in time and space. Um, these vary considerably in children with attention challenges and can compound their difficulties with attention. Um, I think a, a classic example that I see all the time is a child with a, a reading disability and attention challenges. And it's hard to, to excuse me, separate those two things in an older child um, who's having difficulty reading because 
if you're having a hard time focusing on reading, I mean, is it because reading's hard or is it because you're having a hard time focusing on everything? And what I have to do as a developmental behavior pediatrician is sort of sort out, well, what other aspects of your life might you have challenges with attention or self-regulation? And, and is it just reading or is it also math? Is it the reading part of math or is it some of the more conceptual parts of math? Is it the attention part of math? So boiling it, de boiling it down to different sub-skills that are required for specific performance uh, is sort of the nature of what I do. Um, and it can be incredibly um, tricky uh, for parents because, um, well, someone said it was this, and it might, it might just be attention, but if it's also a reading problem, uh, treatment for attention, things that can be effective for attention, aren't necessarily going to solve the reading problem. Uh, so it's important uh, that we look at the whole child, as with anything. Um, getting to uh, the phrase and that long-winded uh, definition of ADHD, um, it's a neurobiological disorder. There are a lot of studies looking at the differences between how brain, the brain functions in people with uh, symptoms of ADHD and those without. Um, there's a growing understanding of the chemical messengers of the brain called neurotransmitters. The two in particular that are uh, most active with attention functions are dopamine and norepinephrine. Um, there's a large body of evidence showing that variable neurotransmitter receptors are distributed along different parts of the brain, different pathways or connections in the brain, differently among people. Okay, that's a long way of saying the way people receive these chemical messages and shunt these messages through their brain to get work done, to get mental work done, varies a lot. Uh, and the belief, at least, is that it varies considerably in terms of how attention output functions vary. So some folks may have stronger receptors in some areas, and that might actually explain how they can focus better. Um, there's a strong body of evidence showing that one particular receptor is associated with risk-taking uh, behaviors, uh, one type of uh, that receptor for, for dopamine. And um, that's important to know because that there's a subpopulation of people with ADHD who are really into skydiving. Um, and if they go to med school, they're really, you know, they become the emergency medical physicians because um, it's exciting. Uh, there's also evidence for uh, high variability in uh, neurotransmitter receptors among individuals with or without ADHD. And I think I've already said that. So looking at what this biology um, sort of translates to visually, um, there's this uh, overly simplified and uh, seductive graphic that's used a lot in a lot of presentations uh, on ADHD. And, and, and sadly, uh, I think because people are visual and they, they like pictures and they especially like uh, functional MRI studies that show how brains operate differently in different uh, cognitive tasks, uh, it, 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 it might make us think that we understand this better than we actually do. Um, but for the purpose of this talk and for um, understanding what we do know, when I was talking about receptors for these chemical messengers, I'm talking about right, right here is on the surface of a nerve cell that allows it to process a signal and send it along a pathway. And the pathways I'm talking about uh, can start at the very base of the brain with some of our more primitive uh, functions like uh, staying awake during a presentation uh, or being able to calm oneself down at night and finally fall asleep and stay asleep. Um, those, those skills um, are highly variable and they're highly uh, state dependent on how much caffeine you had, how much exercise you had, and how much sleep you had the night before. Um, Getting up to the prefrontal cortex where we plan and orchestrate uh, our, our activities as humans, uh, this is the most advanced aspect of our brain, and, and evolutionary biologists would say the, the most recently developed and the latest to, developed, to develop uh, in adolescents and 20-somethings. Uh, um, so when a parent comes to me and they say, how come he can't keep all of his notebooks straight? I'm saying, well, he's 12. And the part of his brain that helps him keep his notebook straight is really still half-baked. 
And if there's some dysfunction, it might even be a little less advanced than that. So we've got to do some things to help it catch up. So I'm weaving back and forth between biology and sort of sociology because it's really important, I think, to understand uh, where our knowledge comes from and that it actually has come a long ways, relatively speaking. Um, ADHD back in the 40s and 50s was called minimal brain dysfunction. How would you like to have been diagnosed with minimal brain dysfunction? Um, kind of pejorative. Uh, uh, shortly thereafter, it was advanced to hyperkinetic disorder of childhood. Uh, my father-in-law, who's a neurologist, used that diagnosis a lot in his training. Um, in the early 70s, there was ADD um, and AD slash HD. Um, now it's, it's equally confusing because ADHD is used both for people with inattentive subtype and combined subtype. Okay? A lot of parents say, ADHD without the H, because she's not hyperactive. Um, so it, it, it does confuse folks, uh, but this is just sort of where the official uh, coding, as it were, and, and, and jargon came from. Um, and how we've understood uh, clinically what this means, uh, it's always been mysterious, uh, but before some of the larger um, epidemiologic studies that were started on ADHD in the 80s uh, and before the technology existed to really compare how two different brains functioned in real time, um, it was always a mysterious uh, and paradoxical sort of uh, response to stimulants that kind of pushed the science of ADHD. How is it that folks who are really active and restless get calmer on a chemical that makes other people really restless and hyperactive. That paradox has always been very hard for people to understand. And one of the ways that I, I try to explain it is one of the biggest functions of uh, the brain that isn't working properly in somebody, for example, who is hyperactive, are the brakes. There are pathways that actually help one realize that they're moving around too much. and help you put on the brakes and slow that down. And when you enhance those pathways uh, uh, with increased access to norepinephrine and dopamine, the brakes can work a little bit better. Um, that's, that is uh, oversimplifying, but, but functional uh, sort of understanding. Uh, and now we've gotten to the point, hopefully, uh, with the standard of care and the conventional wisdom, that ADHD is a neurobiological disorder with great variation. So most fairly sophisticated people who read um, understand that it, these, the stereotypes aren't exactly every child or adult with an attention problem. That being said, I think it's fun to go over what are some of the old myths of ADHD versus the current facts, keeping in mind that the current facts might change in 10 or 20 years, hopefully as science advances. Many still believe that ADHD is purely a social invention and the explanation of the increased rates is because we are holding children to a higher standard. Uh, and, and that's the problem right there. It's not that there's something wrong with them. Um, subsequent studies across the world have shown that in every population, at least in industrial nations, um, there are a certain percentage of individuals who have very common characteristics of restlessness and difficulty focusing when needed. A myth is that most children will grow out of it. Okay, that can be said also for asthma, for eczema, for many things. And that data varies with those conditions. Uh, without studying it, how could you say that? And it has been studied in a third to probably two-fifths of children grow out of many, but rarely all of their symptoms. The symptoms that tend to go down over time are the more hyperactive, impulsive symptoms. Those systems of the brain tend to mature out, whereas the inattentive and disorganized symptoms uh, tend to persist, and sometimes they, be they become exacerbated or worsened uh, over time as the life's demands increase. 
Another myth is that motivation can erase symptoms. Now, motivation can certainly help someone access treatments and do things that will help their attention system function better and get the supports that they need. Um, but the great irony, as I alluded to earlier, is that motivation is driven by the very system that is having the hard time, the attention system and executive functions. So, um, I wanted to wait to talk about the prevalence of ADHD because I think at this point it should be abundantly clear that one person's definition of what an attention problem is might be very different from another person's. And clinicians aren't, uh, you know, perfect <laughs> by a long shot. You don't have to tell anybody who's been a patient, including a, a clinician who's been a patient, that clinicians aren't perfect. Um, and when you try to study a condition, um, even if the criteria are really clear of what this condition is versus what it's not, and they're not as clear with ADHD, results may vary. In some studies, we estimate that the prevalence of ADHD is 3 to 6 percent. Well, that varies by a factor of two. Guess what? There are some studies, they may not be very good ones, that quintuples or, high, or even more that number. Okay. Um, and we know this number varies considerably based on the population that you study in. Um, families who have more access to more clinicians get more diagnoses of the, for their kids. That should come as no surprise to anyone. Um, in some populations, in fact, the level of attention uh, problems may be underestimated. Uh, part of this is because what we call in medicine comorbidities, they mask the diagnosis. So if a child has a uh, learning problem like dyslexia or an anxiety problem. How can you tease that apart from an attention problem? It's really hard. This is what I do for a living and it's really hard for me. I often have to see a child two or three times and really see how they respond to different interventions and how different people who see that child in different settings report how that child does before I can say, hmm, this looks more like anxiety. This, isn't, this is mostly not attention. And sometimes after we treat anxiety, what's left? might be the attention piece that's hard for that child. Um, Inattentive girls are often under-recognized or treated. Uh, if you look stepwise every two or three years in terms of percent of diagnosis by gender, it's fascinating. Uh, boys sort of stabilize by early adolescence. The, the figure for girls keeps going up all the way into adulthood. And, it, and some folks suggest that it even becomes pretty even. But early on, it's, it's highly male predominant. And the main reason, we think at least for that, is boys tend to have more of the external hyperactive uh, uh, impulsive symptoms that aren't subtle and can create more problems so they get help faster. In adolescence, where there is a full-on storm of developmental changes in the brain, in the body, uh, Seeing uh, someone who's 14 uh, as a new diagnosis of uh, ADHD is very also very difficult to do because where does normal adolescence uh, end and, and ADHD begin? You know, being sort of a forgetful teen is sort of redundancy, or as Bill Cosby used to say, they're brain damaged. Okay, that's a joke. Um, adolescence really makes it hard uh, diagnostically. Uh, I will often have. Uh, young teens uh, come to me in my practice for the first time and uh, their parents are like, this can't be ADHD, right? Because because we would have known sooner. And a good percent of the time, there is evidence to suggest that, that that individual had problems with attention functioning much earlier. Other times, there isn't. They were sailing along. And for some reason now, because of the fragileness of attention functions during adolescence in particular, with all of the different developmental changes of the brain during that time period, they've met their water and it's become harder for them. Um, one thing that's, <clears throat> pardon me, becoming more and more understood, and I think this is an area of growing uh, uh, knowledge and research that I'm uh, excited about because I think it's, it's more compatible with a, with a logical, biological sort of plausibility for this disease, this condition to exist, is it goes into adulthood. 
but it changes. There's a natural history, just like other chronic conditions. What starts off as uh, in childhood may be a little bit different in uh, adolescence and may be a little bit different in early adulthood. Um, and the high proportion of uh, children who go on to adulthood with persistent symptoms show adult manifestations of their condition which are not trivial. Uh, these have to do with social functioning, uh, keeping a job, uh, uh, higher academic functioning, uh, driving, uh, uh, problems with the law, problems with relationships. Um, when I talk about when I talked earlier about the comorbidities, I think it's real important that people understand what go what should go on in the mind of a clinician if they're seeing you or your child or your friend's child uh, and attention has been raised as a problem. Okay, um, lots of different things can cause inattentiveness, or you could even you could substitute hyperactivity. This is a concept I learned uh, as a pediatric resident here at UCSF uh, from the, the lung doctors, and their phrase was, all that wheezes is not asthma, okay? And I superimposed that same sort of phrase on ADHD and tried to list all the different things that could masquerade as an attention problem or a self-regulation problem in a child. There are other medical conditions such as seizures, anemia, chronic pain, sleep disorders, there are actual major sensory problems with hearing or vision, uh, medication side effects can cause uh, children to be inattentive or tired or hyperactive. There are other neurobiological conditions which I've already alluded to like learning disabilities or intellectual disability, uh, autism's hiding right there. There are emotional disorders such as depression, anxiety, bipolar, there are sources of family distress, divorce, illness, child abuse, uh, exposure to violence, uh, the challenges of foster care for children. And there's school factors. There's mismatches. Uh, you know, kids will often do real well with the right teacher and, and quite poorly with the wrong teacher. Uh, and inappropriate school environments are expectations for some children. Not, uh, schools are not like shoes. There's no one size fits all here. Or hats, I should say. So, when a clinician in the community is looking at a child or an adolescent or a young adult and thinking about an attention problem, it's important that the consumer, the patient, know that, knows that ADHD is a behavioral diagnosis. There is no specific diagnostic medical test. So, I'll have families who come and bring me reams and reams and reams of testing and saying, he doesn't have ADHD or he definitely has ADHD. And one test, two tests, three tests don't exist in isolation. They don't tell you how that child does in swimming versus soccer versus reading versus math versus in the morning versus the evening. And that's what, a, what we say in medicine, a good old fashioned H&P, a history talking and a physical examining tells a good clinician. Um, it's important also that people understand that at least currently the criteria for ADHD, the way they've been developed, are very still very strongly biased towards school-aged kids. Uh, you know, keeps desk disorganized or messy is one of the criteria. Well, first of all, kids don't even have desks anymore. If you've been into a classroom, desks are an anachronism. They're still out there, but there are more and more classrooms where it's sort of a common workspace, a table. Okay, the kids are sharing space in. And three and four year olds really don't have desks. <laughs> okay. um, I talked about comorbidities. It's important that uh, if, if symptoms of difficulty with attention or hyperactivity are coming from anxiousness, for example, uh, you can't call that ADHD. You call it anxiousness and you treat that first. And it requires information from two settings. This one's really tricky because um, what are those two settings? Most commonly it's school and home, okay? Clinicians, I think, have a bias towards what they see, <coughs> what we see, feel, smell, can touch, can hear. Uh, clinicians, I think, are sometimes biased towards versus the story and the different perspectives of the different people around that child, okay? 
when I work with residents um, here at UCSF, uh, they sometimes have the opportunity during our rotation to do a school observation uh, on a child that we're assessing, you know, with permission of their parents and the school, of course. And I say, that's going to be one of the most valuable things you see because this is catching a kiddo in their natural environment, okay? And I, I make the horrible comparison. This is the difference between going to the zoo and looking at the tiger through the cage and going on a safari, okay? You see a lot more of the real behavior and the real expectations that are set for a child when you get the information from school uh, or from other settings that tend to see the child a lot more than clinicians. I mean, we, we, at most we see kids every few months for 15 minutes. The official uh, criteria comes from this book uh, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual for um, Psychological and Psychiatric uh, Illnesses, the uh, most current version is version 4. Um, it says that at least six inattentive or hyperactive slash impulsive symptoms have to occur in order for it to be full-fledged. Okay, um, Pretty arbitrary. Uh, it doesn't say that they have to be in all the settings all the time. If it's five in one setting and six in another setting and I see that the child's having some real dysfunction, then I'll, you know, I'll make the diagnosis. But if it's two or three, um, that's not enough. It has to cause some impairment before the age of seven. This is tricky, and I think this is going to change with the new criteria that might be coming out in a couple years with the, the version five. Uh, it's extremely hard in an 18 year old who comes to my clinic to remember back what it was like when he was six. It's very hard. Those of you who have kids who are teenagers or older now, try to remember what they were like when they were six. I have a seven year old, I'm trying to remember what he was like when he was six. Um, Two more settings, once again, it's important. Continuously for at least six months. I, I think this is really important. Uh, ADHD doesn't go on vacation. Uh, when a kid's on vacation, it's still there. Might be different, okay? Might manifest itself a little bit differently because there's less structure or less demand, but there still will be manifestations of difficulties. Uh, and the most important thing, what else could this be? So there's a phrase we use in medicine a lot. Uh, a condition is a diagnosis of exclusion, meaning the clinician has gone down a list of all the things that this could be and essentially ruled them out based on the story. And that's, it's, it's not that. It's not that. I'll, I'll test for that. Maybe it's that. I'll test for that. It's not that. Oh, okay. It's this. Okay. And there's tension because if, you, if, if, if you're a parent of a child who's suffering of something that's relatively common, like ADD or ADHD is, and a clinician is going through and ruling everything under the sun out with multiple tests and visits, that could be a waste of time. Okay? But it's important, like anything, that there's a balance, that, that at least these other conditions are being thought of. Um, because misdiagnosing or misclassifying a child uh, will lead to treatment that isn't as effective. Um, when I talk about different clinical perspectives, uh, people probably uh, know, but I'll just review uh, the different people who make the diagnosis of ADD or ADHD in children and adults are psychologists, so PhDs or, or PsyDs, uh, PSYDs, um, people who um, are uh, clinically trained uh, to do testing and, and diagnosis of psychological and psychiatric disorders. Um, the bias of, of, of psychologists, and I work with several wonderful psychologists, is they like to test. They like some hard evidence and perspective. Uh, psychiatrists, these are MDs who did a residency in psychiatry, uh, child psychiatry, child and adolescent psychiatry. Um, developmental behavior pediatricians like myself and child neurologists. Of the three MDs, uh, I think that the bias in perspectives on ADHD in terms of what perspective each person has based on their training does vary, but what's interesting to me is when I talk to psychiatrists or child psychiatrists or child neurologists, we see the same kid and we use a lot of the same language and we almost always agree on what we're seeing, 
But what's interesting is across the country, who actually sees children with attention or learning problems varies a lot based on just the market forces of who's out there. For example, I had a patient in my private practice who was seeing me in Los Gatos uh, move to Texas and uh, they sent me a nice note saying, oh, we found somebody and they were a neurologist because it turns out in this part of the country, that's who sees kids with attention problems. And so that varies. Um, a ver an interesting study that I sort of alluded to <laughs> earlier, uh, multiple studies actually, um, say that only a minority, about 20% of children who end up with a diagnosis of ADHD show hyperactive behavior in a physician's uh, office or in a clinician's office. And uh, to me, this really underscores the point that when we're looking at two settings, the most important settings are where the kid actually spends most of their time, and that's not in the clinician's office. Okay. Many, many, many children can do really well for 15 or 20 minutes in an office and uh, very, very poorly in their classroom or on the soccer field. Okay. And the, the contrary is also very true. Kids get the heebie-jeebies when they come to see the doctor who gives them a shot whether they have an attention issue or not. Doctors make people anxious, and you see behavior when you make people anxious. Um, and then another point I alluded to earlier, and there's a lot of data suggesting that the distribution of ADHD diagnosis seems to fall along socioeconomic lines, so it's much higher in places that have higher access to these clinicians. It would be extremely um, sort of one-sided uh, and American of me to think that <laughs> my perspective on ADHD was uh, the only one. And it's, it, it, to me, I find it really fascinating when I talk to folks um, who've spent a lot of time in countries outside the United States and when I read um, different papers and reports on how uh, attention is viewed from different cultures, um, one that I came across that I thought was nice to share was uh, this one it came from a recent Chinese st uh, study done out of Beijing and Shanghai on the epidemiology or the patterns of attention and the perspectives of, uh, of what ADHD might be with, uh, among parents and clinicians in, in China. Some parents and teachers regard attention deficit as an ordinary characteristic uh, during a child's growing phases. So not that different from the norm. Uh, others are unwilling to admit that their children are suffering from a mental disease. Uh, so perhaps an element of denial or not accepting that this is a disease, which people do everywhere. Uh, another uh, <coughs> interesting quote I came across, uh, French child psychiatrists in general view um, ADHD as a medical condition that has psychosocial and situational causes. Notice, not biological causes. Uh, therefore, instead of treating children's focusing and behavioral problems with drugs, French doctors prefer to look for the underlying issue that is causing the child distress, not in the child's brain, but in the child's social environment. It goes on. Okay. I think this perspective is really important, but it should come as no surprise the studies of ADHD in France have much smaller numbers than here because of this. And this brings us to therapy. If, 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 if one can swallow the pill that this condition exists and there are some things to, to help children uh, and adolescents do better uh, functionally with uh, attention, um, what are some of the things that help? Uh, what do we know? Uh, my background, um, I have a master's in public health and clinical effectiveness. Uh, I've done research. I understand how to sort of interpret research. But I'm a clinician at heart. And I can read a lot of papers and say, this is the evidence base. It's strong. It's weak. It's non-existent. But when I have numerous patients who have tried things and it's helped them or not, that's in my database too. They're different databases. Uh, and I think the database that the general public uses the most uh, based on one individual's background, if you're a scientist, maybe you, you read the papers too. Uh, you know, but sometimes folks trust what, their, what happened to their neighbor's kid more than what their doctor says or what they read in the paper. Um, anecdotes are very powerful. Stories are extremely powerful. And there are lots of stories that I've heard uh, for many of these alternative therapies. Um, 
But fortunately, there's also on the other side of the evidence spectrum some scientific backing or at least attempt to understand uh, the validity of, of these different treatment modalities. In particular, uh, psychological counseling, which is a huge, diverse category, I'm kind of embarrassed just to lump it all together, there's a mixed evidence of support for helping children and families with ADHD. Probably the strongest evidence is in older kids with one-on-one -on -one therapy, okay, and in group work with sort of medium age kids, eight, nine, ten, where they work in groups to work on their skills and of self-control um, and focusing. Uh, and that's peer and social support. There's strong evidence there. Exercise, there's a, a strong body of evidence um, that cardiovascular exercise in particular, but other types of exercise are very helpful for uh, children and adults who have attention dysfunctions. I'll touch on uh, exercise later because it's one of my favorite things to prescribe. Uh, environmental therapy, so people th uh, have posited the theory that walking around in nature is soothing and helps an attention system mature and function. That evidence is sparse, but there's nothing wrong with walking around in nature. Hypnosis, um, there are a few small studies of this. The world, the jury's not back on that. But hypnosis has been used in other pediatric behavioral conditions uh, very effectively. Uh, meditation needs to be studied more. Biofeedback, there's mixed evidence. Um, uh, biofeedback uh, has to do with a person's ability in real time to control how they're functioning based on getting feedback. So a modality called neurofeedback has been tried um, where kids literally have sensors attached to their brain, like for an EEG, like for a brain scan. Uh, people with seizures have those uh, brain scans. Uh, but they have these electrodes put on their brain, and they can play a video game that requires focus. And the, the object of the game, like if it's a bird flying, will dip down if they're less focused based on characteristic brainwave readings that are associated with more focus. So that's real-time biofeedback. So that's, theoretically, that sounds like a fantastic therapy. In practice, it's, it's hard. It's hard to do that. And, it, and the people who uh, do uh, neurofeedback, um, they vary in quality and they vary in protocols. Um, but it's a fascinating idea. And uh, for some kids, it works. Uh, and it could be quite expensive. Sensory integration therapy, there's some evidence uh, for this. Uh, I, I work with several occupational therapists um, who have made a big difference in my patients. Um, but I think it's really understudied and under understood. Uh, auditory integration therapy or listening therapy, there's very little uh, standardized evidence to show that this works well. Uh, but there, I, I certainly have patients who have done it and said it helped them. I've had uh, probably an equal number of patients who've done it and said it was a waste of their time. Behavioral optometry, uh, I've had a small number of patients who have said this has worked for them. Uh, several others who have been disappointed with it. Um, but I do support many of these modalities. Uh, but I hold them to the same standard that I would hold, say, medication. I say, hey, let's look at the potential risks and benefits. Let's look at the time commitment, the money commitment, the hope commitment that you're going to put into this, okay, and think about how it might help your child. Exercise, as I said, is one of my favorite things to prescribe. If I had a pill for it, I'd be a billionaire. Um, many theories as to why exercise might help with ADHD. Uh, if you were my fourth grade teacher, Mr. Stork, you made us run because it just tired us out uh, so much that we couldn't misbehave in class. And we may have been onto something. Um, Certainly, different forms of exercise promote coordination and social skills. Uh, I mean, that's hopefully abundantly obvious. Um, but exercise has been found in multiple studies uh, to enhance learning pathways. There's a thing called brain-derived neurotropic factor that actually helps you make new connections in your brain that increases with exercise. Um, so exercise can be very powerful at actually 
remapping and strengthening connections in your brain. And this is cardiovascular exercise. Um, there's a really good book out there that there's a nice uh, compendium of the evidence, the scientific evidence for exercise with multiple conditions, including anxiety, depression, menopause, age and senility, and ADHD um, by a guy named John Ratty. Um, in it, he talks about how um, men apparently have to exercise a little bit more than women do uh, to get the same benefit. Um, that is interesting, and I don't think anybody understands why. Uh, you could always say it's because women aren't, in, they're smarter already, but no one's, no one likes that feeling. <coughs> useful, uh, exercise is a useful adjunct, at the very least, okay, when patients do some exercise, it'll enhance other aspects of their life. Uh, as a primary therapy, it's the only thing, um, like if you're Michael Phelps, and you win eight gold medals and you have ADHD, exercise might be your primary therapy because you're swimming you know, hours every day. Um, but for most folks, practically, it can't be your primary therapy because how much time in the day do, do parents have to get their kids uh, exercise? Um, sp some specific types of exercise have been studied. Uh, gymnastics, martial arts, yoga. Um, uh, I haven't seen any papers on swimming, although I would love it if, there, if I saw some papers on swimming. A recent paper came out on yoga uh, that reduced stress in adolescents. Um, <coughs> not strong evidence yes, yet about focus, although it's, it's highly suspected that yoga helps with focus. When I work with families, um, I like to talk about some of the basics that have uh, been tried and tried again uh, with many uh, experts and clinicians uh, around ADD, ADHD. Um, the four R's, okay, everybody heard about the three R's in academics, well those are the four R's of helping kids with uh, attention problems. Routines, reminders, rituals, and rhythms, okay. Routines have to do with how do you get up and get ready for the day, how do you transition, uh, when you get home from school, and how do you get ready for bed? An example of a, of a, a routine booster will be v visual schedules for getting dressed in the morning. I cannot tell you how many parents come to me with the, the hair pulling out of, I can't get him ready for school. Okay. Uh, and much of the time, if we can break down a system that helps the child actually get themselves mostly ready, um, and incentivizes them for doing that uh, with a visual schedule, it's helpful. Reminders. Um, for uh, middle schoolers and high schoolers, not knowing what to put in their backpack, where to put it, and when to get it out um, is really hard. And if you, if you ha make, have them make a checklist and actually attach it to the backpack so they can see that checklist, uh, it can be very helpful. Uh, but they have to be able to see it. Reminders. A piece of paper in my pocket is the worst kind of reminder. I find it after I've done the laundry. It's this crumpled mass. Oh, what was I supposed to do? It has to be, it has to be in, in, in one's visual space to be useful. Um, certainly technology with everyone walking around with iPhones and bells and whistles can be helpful in that respect for reminders as well. Um, I have parents who don't remember to give their kids their meds and I say, gosh, you got an iPhone there. Why don't we set it up a reminder right now? Um, rituals. Um, so, you know, fighting over cleanup of toys or materials is a big thing, okay? Uh, kids with uh, attention uh, challenges, they're really good at getting into it and then they're gone on to the next thing. Sort of, gra they're grazing across activities and the whole cleanup piece is like, eh, don't want to do that. I want to move on to the next toy, I want to move on to the next activity. So, creating a space, creating trays, creating easy access and easy put away. Um, rituals really helps cut down on conflict. Um, rhythms. Um, understanding that the access to mental energy and focus varies over the day. Uh, and it varies individually. Some people are morning people, some people are, are afternoon people. Um, not trying to have a child do something that's really hard for them at the time of day where their energy is the lowest uh, is commonsensical, but there are many, many situations in which the, the pressure of homework creates this horrible tension. Uh, as soon as the kid gets home, 
um, it becomes sort of the torture. We must get this done, whether we're at all ready to do it or not. So a lot of families find out if they get a good snack in, if they get a little exercise in, Johnny's more ready for doing homework. And some folks do really well with sprinting. They get a timer, and they do it for 20 minutes, and then they take a break. And they know uh, they can work, they can sustain their attention for that short period of time because they're going to get a break. Uh, but when children are faced with this sort of Mount Everest of homework, uh, and they don't think they're going to get a break, it's, it's a lot harder to marshal the energy and the motivation to do it. That being said, um, it wouldn't be a talk about attention challenges if I didn't talk about medication. Um, my philosophy about medication is it's one tool in the toolbox. It's not the tool. Um, it's a powerful tool. It's a tool that is uh, often uh, misunderstood and often uh, overused um, and scary, especially if you read the New York Times this weekend. Um, there's an article about the, uh, the misuse of medicine to help boost test scores and the potential addictive uh, capacity of stimulant medications with adolescents. Um, the criteria I use, though, in uh, deciding whether or not to offer medication um, for attention uh, dysfunction or ADHD, first and foremost, safety. I have some kids who bolt, and if they bolt in front of a car, they usually don't get a second chance to do that. Um, or they're really impulsive, and other kids get hurt when they play with them, and they feel really bad. They don't want to hurt other kids. It just happens. Problems with bonding or getting along. Okay. <laughs> When parents are tearing up because they're not liking their kids anymore, or they're seeing other children not like their children, or they know that the teachers turned against their child, um, that is often cause for thinking about well, what can we do to help this child do better. Obviously, we have to work with the environment, but if we can f change the game and how this child is able to play and function, we might be able to help their relationships. Problems with learning, probably the biggest thing that brings in the most parents. He's really behind in reading. And that really matters to us, and we want to do what we can to fix his reading. And sometimes it's just the reading. Sometimes it's attention. Sometimes it's reading and attention. Problems with self-esteem. So younger kids, they don't articulate, oh, I feel horrible about myself, what's wrong with me, um, in, in words so much. They get frustrated or easier. They, they don't try uh, harder tasks. Um, older kids will say, how come, I, how come I'm the last one to finish this work? How come, how come I have to stay in for recess to finish this? How come I can't get my homework done? How come I'm stupid? Okay. You hear, I hear this all the time. Um, and it's pretty rare for me to march down this list with a, a family member and some of this stuff is you know, happening and this isn't happening. That being said, what do we know about um, how medicines uh, work in terms of effectiveness? Um, stimulants are first-line therapy, at least currently, for uh, attention problems. They've been the most studied, and they're the quickest and most effective of the medications. Um, lots of families come to me with an ad or a TV commercial and say, I want this, and I say, why? And they say, because it's not a stimulant. And I say, okay, what if I told you the chances of a stimulant working are three or four times higher than that? Oh, really? What if I told you that that has side effects too? And these are their, their side effects. They're different from side effects of stimulants. And families go, oh, okay. Uh, that being said, only 70% respond to a single stimulant, meaning if you put all the names of all the products in a hat and you stick your hand in there, like little f Chinese fortune pieces of paper, and you pull one out and you say, oh, this one, and you try it, there's about 70% chance it's going to help if the diagnosis is correct. That's pretty good in medicine. There are a few things, in fact, in medicine that work that well. Um, but the onus is on uh, the clinician to make sure that the diagnosis is accurate. Because if the diagnosis is inaccurate, that number goes way down. Um, the number goes up even more if you are patient with your clinician <laughs> and give them a second draw into the hat. Okay, that one didn't work so well. We tried that at a couple doses. Didn't seem to do much. 
Let's try something different. Okay. Um, that being said, there's still 10% or so of kids who, after several different medications, um, they don't seem to get much of a response, the non-responders. And the most important thing I think a parent or a teacher or a clinician should ask themselves if, it, if a child's been a non-responder is, do we have the diagnosis correct? What else is going on? And if it seems like that's been adequately addressed, then okay, what are other things we need to be doing too? Um, sadly, there are no indications uh, which medications to try first. There are trends based on the, the bulk or the compendium of the evidence out there. Uh, the two different families of um, stimulants uh, are a little bit different. Their side effects can be a little bit different. They've been studied disproportionately, one more so in young kids and one more so in older kids. So I sort of use that as a guideline, but I tell f families if we've tried one in one family and we've gone up the, on the dose and we haven't gotten anything that we like yet, it makes sense to try something in the other family. Knowing that there's a diversity of neurotransmitter receptors across kids and how they're going to respond to different products differently. I'm not wedded to any product. I'm wedded to efficacy. I'm wedded to being safe and effective. Uh, and most clinicians are. Um, that's just how it works. Um, when deciding what medicine to use, rather than pull the, pulling the ad out of the parenting magazine or the commercial you saw on late night TV, um, uh, Clinicians uh, should be asking, can your child swallow pills? Because <laughs> some, some medicines, you, you, that's the only way to take them. Uh, there's a patch uh, for kids who can't swallow pills. Uh, there are capsules that can be opened up and put on um, food, um, which can be effective. Um, how long do you need the medicine to last? There's short-acting medicines, three to four hours. There's medium-acting medicines, maybe six to eight hours, and there's long-acting medicines, 10 to 13 hours. Will it get paid for? That's really important to patients, I find. I used to try to be puritanical and go, well, I'm gonna prescribe what I think is gonna work best for you, and I don't care if your insurance covers it, and that didn't last very long, because I'm a patient too. I don't, I don't wanna to have to pay $50 for something when I can pay $5 if it's gonna work just as good. I want, I want something that I can actually try. It takes a lot for a parent to get over uh, a lot of the uh, stigma and, and fear in deciding to try to use a, uh, uh, a medication for behavior. And once they do, they actually want to do it. They don't want to wait around for the insurance to improve it or approve it or um, pay a lot for it. Availability, there is currently um, a national shortage of several stimulants. And I'm just starting now to routinely ask my patients, have you had a hard time finding that? Because <laughs> I'm trying to keep track of what's going on. Uh, because I, I don't want folks to be left high and dry if a medicine's been effective and helpful for them. I don't want them to uh, be starting off the school year without any. Um, family history, um, as the science improves, understanding uh, how different uh, genomes and different receptor profiles in individuals um, affects which medications work better is going to be really interesting to follow. Just clinically, if I've got a parent who tells me, I tried this and it worked really well, I'm more likely to try that with their child because it's their child. Presumably they share a lot of biological characteristics. Uh, this is my last slide before questions. Um, in general, I think, uh, and this is the case for probably all of the neurobiological disorders and really most conditions of childhood, it is equally important to identify a child's strengths as it is to uncover a child's dysfunctions. Okay. I try to always start by listing a child's strengths when I'm writing out a plan for a parent uh, because we want to keep those we want to develop those. Those can often be the islands that help the weaknesses. The best prescription is apt to derive from the best detailed description. One of my favorite phrases from medical school is, diseases don't read textbooks. J 
just because it doesn't sound exactly like the paragraph you have in the textbook doesn't mean it's not a problem or there isn't something you can do about it. A unitary form of management, such as the use of medication, is virtually never the whole answer to a child's struggles. There always should be a multifaceted collaborative approach. And that's where I see things taking off for kids with attention problems uh, when sort of the triangle of home, school, and the individual are all getting uh, enhanced for that child's well-being and function. That's my last slide. It's a great question. The question was when there are several uh, different problems going on simultaneously, how do you prioritize or decide which one to address first? And I think uh, that really hinges on how uh, the evaluation is done by the clinician. Okay? Um, there should be a lot of time in the evaluation devoted to how is the child functioning in their major environments. So how are they functioning at school, how are they function at home, how are they function in their basic functions like eating, sleeping. Um, because when one lists problems out, I mean, we all use a common sort of triad, learning disability, anxiety, and attention problem. Um, any one of those could be the lead player. Okay? The story and how the child's functioning will often tell you which one. So if a, if a child has signs of anxiety throughout their day and it's limiting their sleep and it's, a fun, it's, it's, it's affecting how well they can focus and they also have a, a comorbid learning problem, I'm probably going to focus on the anxiety as my number one priority because if this child can have more coping skills or can biologically be less anxious, they're going to sleep better. And what's going to happen if they sleep better? They're going, to fun they're going to focus better. And what's going to happen if they're focused better? Then the learning disability won't be as exacerbated by the anxiousness and the attention problem. So um, that is, is hard, and it's, and it's, it's real important, um, I think, for clinicians to help families prioritize because it's overwhelming. Families come to me all the time, I don't know what to do first. I got all this testing, I got all these labels. Well, what's real here, and what should I do first? Um, and if we just sort of get down and talk about what's a day in the life of Johnny like and where are his pitfalls and where are his high points and where are his low points, it often comes out in the story which, which of the challenges is, is the, the biggest one. The analogy I like to use is for anxiety, again, as an example, it's a cloud over some other problems that are there. That cloud lifts, we actually see what's going on a little bit better. Um, and then address what's left. Next question. The question is, is whether I, as a development behavior pediatrician, work with schools in creating uh, what are called 504 plans uh, for ADD, ADHD. And just as background, a 504 plan is based on the educational law, Title 504 accommodations, uh, reasonable accommodations to help a child access the regular curriculum to be in a regular class if they have what's called it's all jargon, it's full of three letter acronyms, an OHI, an other health impairment. It could be cerebral palsy, it could be diabetes, it could be ADHD. Anything that gets in the way of a child's ability to access a regular curriculum that's a health condition can trigger a 504 plan. Now what is a 504 plan? It's accommodations in the classroom and, and, and some general academic accommodations that allow the child to sort of physically and psychologically have access to the curriculum. For a child with ADD, some common examples of 504 plans um, are preferential seating. So for anybody here with ADHD who really wanted, wanted to get every point and not be sort of lost in space for this lecture, you should be sitting right here, or you should be sitting right here. Unless you're super anxious. Then a couple rows back. Okay. Preferential seating is actually really important uh, for the educator to, mo educator to monitor the child and for the child to monitor the educator. And I, I, I always mention preferential seating first because thinking about how the space works for the child and the educator working with the child is extremely important. Okay? Because everything else that the educator is going to try to do that's an accommodation, such as a secret signal, instead of saying, Johnny, sit down. Johnny, sit down. Johnny, I told you to sit down. Going, Johnny. 
because they already agreed that means sit down. That's more discreet, it's a little funny, it's more likely to get Johnny's attention and less likely to make Johnny feel embarrassed. Um, so there's a myriad of things. There's testing accommodations for kids whose attention challenges only affect how they test. There's lots of different things. So I'll probably answer your question and whether or not I help to develop these. That I work with parents and say, these are some things generically that will help your child and these are some things specifically that will help your child. But like any um, sort of contract or piece of paper that you yeah, put together uh, and you work with the school or somebody with a child uh, who has uh, an attention challenge, it's a dance. It's a transactional experience. Uh, the parent needs to partner with the educator and the educator needs to partner with the parent to monitor how well it's going. 504 is just a piece of paper. Um, I will often quiz my patients on what their accommodations actually are because if the kiddo has no idea that they're supposed to sit in the front row, okay, and they tell you that they're not, clearly that's not happening, right? Or they're not getting breaks, or they're not get, I have a lot of older kids who have, who have test-taking accommodations written in, but they never take them because they're embarrassed. They don't want to get out of the classroom and have to go to a quiet space and get more time to take the test. And I try to encourage them, try it. Use it or lose it. If you don't, try it and see if it helps you or not. It may help you, it may not help you. You'll never have access to it later on when you might need it. Um, so that's, a, that's an art. Um, there's a lot of good stuff written out there. There's a website called Rights Law. Um, there are a lot other websites, schwablearning.com, um, uh, LD Online. Uh, my, one of my favorites is Attitude Mag, A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E. Um, really good uh, uh, we website um, and just a blog. They send you emails all the time. I just got a new email today uh, from Attitude. Uh, very helpful for parents. A D D I T U D E. Dot, I think it's dot com. Might be dot org. If you Google it, it'll think for you. Next question. I'll tell you what I do personally based on my own training, and I'll tell you what other people do uh, in other disciplines like psychologists or psychiatrists or um, uh, neurologists. What they'll do a little bit differently because um, I think. The key here is, it's like, a, you know, there's a recipe for success and accurate diagnosis uh, and, and, and catching other things that could masquerade or go along with an attention problem. And the key ingredients, um, y y you need to have some semi-objective uh, assessment. So I do uh, a thing called the peaks in the pyramid. They are assessments of what are called neurodevelopmental skills. So it, it's, these are games that were designed that you play with kids. Um, you, you look at how coordinated they are when they write. You look at how coordinated they are when they jump up and down. Uh, you, you look at um, how their memory works uh, for uh, sequencing, how their memory works for language, how their memory works for visual spatial like pictures. Uh, you look at how their reader, reading comprehension works. Uh, you look at what's called phonemic awareness, which is critical for reading. And people with dyslexia have poor phonemic awareness. Um, so it breaks down many different skills required for learning. When I do that targeted assessment with my patients, it tells me, oh, this guy's got pretty good skills across the board, but he's really inconsistent. He like misses an easy one and then gets a hard one right. Uh, he really has a hard time remembering uh, two things at the same time. It really is a hard time using new information that's sort of active working memory with new rules to solve problems. Those are all attention problems versus a kid who doesn't really get that pH makes pho and doesn't really get how to take one letter out of a word to make a different sound. They just don't understand how letters make sounds and make words. That child probably has dyslexia and might look like they have an attention problem in a class that's a lot of reading. Um, so that's, that's what I do. Um, I also do a, uh, a parent and teacher uh, behavior scale, and there are different behavior scales out there. So a parent and a teacher will fill in a bunch of bubbles on uh, lots of different symptoms. That's sort of a global look at the child. And I use that to make sure I'm not missing something like anxiety or depression 
or, or something else that might be going on emotionally with the child that could explain why their attention isn't working. Because nothing hurts the attention system more than, say, depression in childhood. Kids who are really sad about what's going on in their lives uh, have a hard time focusing and have a hard time motivating. So, excuse me, I use a general screen for uh, emotional stuff. I use a specific targeted assessment to get at what their skills of learning are. And then I add on the old-fashioned history and physical, talking about the problem, when it began, when it manifests itself, um, what makes it better, what makes it worse, the kind of things that doctors should be doing with whatever you tell them. Uh, psychiatrists uh, have a, a somewhat similar approach. They do less testing. Uh, they do use a lot of um, brief uh, assessments uh, or score sheets, standardized score sheets. Um, uh, psychologists do a lot more testing. Uh, they'll test the kid's IQ. They'll test their academic achievement. They'll do all kinds of stuff to get as many perspectives quanti to quantify where their skills are as possible. Um, in addition to an overall assessment of how the kid's functioning. Um, and neurologists uh, do a lot on f well, their physical exam is important uh, and their observations are important. Um, so somewhat different perspectives based on, on how a person's trained. But I think a good history in physical, something semi-objective where you really get a sense of the child's skills to make sure we're not missing a learning problem, and a global look at how the child's functioning emotionally at home and at school. Those are all key ingredients. And time. Uh, I, with experience, I've learned that uh, when the child comes back uh, in a month or two, uh, the evaluation isn't over. There's always more information that might nuance or change the, uh, the profile of of the diagnoses or the strengths and weaknesses of that child, so you know, ninety minutes is a, ninety minutes is still just a, that's that's how long my new evaluation new evaluations are. It's still just a snapshot in a child's life. Uh, some folks out there do three uh, hour long evaluations before they come up with a final sort of profile. So the question is, what are the tools in the toolbox? I mentioned um, medicine is just one of the tools. Exercise is a tool. Uh, those four R's, sort of using reminders, rituals, um, et cetera, that's one of the tools. A 504 plan with the school is one of the tools. Um, lots of things. So it's, it's, it can be a very full toolbox, um, which could make you know, uh, the, the parent a little overwhelmed at times. Um, uh, the art of, of really helping is giving uh, the child and the family the right tools at the right time. So uh, I think good evaluations list several of the tools that will be helpful. And even better, prioritize which ones might give you the most bang for your buck in the beginning. Okay, similar to the first question about sort of if you've got different uh, problems, what, which one do you attack first on medication? So I think the question, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, is for people who start medicine and stay on it, how, how many stay on it sort of into adult, early adulthood? And uh, the figure I, sh I showed earlier, sort of 33 to 40%, okay, is ballpark what we think happens. The problem is, is when you become 18, even way before you're 18, medicine, whether it's useful or not, is an option. It's not mandated. So I've had several teenagers who have cheeked their pills, meaning they just took it in there. Yep, mom, I took it. And when mom's not looking, bloop, in the garbage. Okay. At a certain point, kids decide whether or not to take the medicine, whether it's effective or not. So it's very hard to design a study that tells you exactly what percent of folks need the medicine still going on early into adulthood because at some point people decide they don't want to take it. Now, people who don't want to take the medicine, they might, that might be a, um, a, a sample that's biased uh, because they're having side effects or it's not helping. Uh, m most of the time, if I have a kiddo who's uh, pretty reluctant to take medicine, uh, if they decide to go along with it for a month or two, 
and then they find that the medicine's helpful, they're not as reluctant because it's, it's logical. Kids are very logical. This is helping me, fine, I'll do it. If the perception is it's not helping me or it's hurting me, there are side effects, why would I do this? Okay. Um, so um, definitely, I'd, you know, I'd say at least the data I've seen argues for a strong third of folks going into adulthood still benefiting from medicine. Um, when we talk about adult or early adult ADD and ADHD, I think um, a lot of the writing by uh, John Raddy and, uh, and Ned Hollowell are, is very useful. Uh, they say in their book, Driven to Distraction and Delivered from Distraction, that probably the two most important life decisions somebody makes who has an attention problem uh, is who do you marry, so who do you couple with, who do you work with, and what kind of work do you do? Okay. If you want to be an air traffic controller, you better exercise a lot and have, had, have some tools that really help you be on point. Um, uh, if you want to be an artist, great, fantastic. Okay. Uh, if you want to do well uh, in a work environment, it better be a place that values you for your strengths and doesn't prey upon your weaknesses. Um, uh, and in relationships, hopefully somebody who kind of gets that uh, person with ADHD is unique uh, and has strengths and isn't just scatterbrained and not motivated. Okay, that's extremely important because uh, families who have one or more members with ADHD have a much higher rate of divorce and, and problems. Thank you.